Good afternoon, everyone. Let's try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, there we are. Isn't it great to be back in the auditorium? Yes. Uh, my name is Danica. Several of you probably have received one or a hundred emails from me in the past three years. Um, I'm the director of Creative Living here at Sand Hills, and we are honored to have you all here on campus. We appreciate that. Uh, being in this area, we have lots of great resources like this college, but even more so, we have resources like the individuals that have moved and lived here. Uh, Jason is going to be talking with us today. Several of you, I know, have taken some of his classes in the past. So let's just listen back and see what Jason has to share with us and uh, see what we can do for the future. Thank you all for being here. All right, if you've taken a class with me before, you know we're going to have a few quizzes today. No, I'm kidding. You don't have to pull any pen and paper today. Uh, but I do want to take us through a 20-year history lesson and, and look at some of the results of that history lesson. A lot of these lessons not learned from previous wars. You've probably heard Afghanistan compared to Vietnam. I, I think a better comparison is the Korean War. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today and how those two relate. Uh, so I've worked on Afghanistan since 2002. So this has been a 19-year journey for me. I've had some portfolio on Afghanistan in some way, in some part of the government, or as an advisor to the government, or to the Afghan government uh, since 2002. So this is everything I know um, for my adult life. This is what I've worked on. And as you can imagine, since August, on all my emails and uh, messaging, uh, boards. I've been getting requests from the hundreds and probably thousands of Afghans that I've worked with over the last 20 years uh, that need help that are trying to get out and then helping people who've already made it over here. So it has been a, a pretty traumatic year for a lot of people and, and it's still unfolding. We've, we've still probably got about 100,000 Afghans that we promised uh, future citizenship in America stuck in Afghanistan. So we'll see where that goes. So I'm going to take you on this journey from 2002, up in this, in this top here, where you see a guy wearing you know, a really old helmet. That's 2002. We were literally uh, starting to build an army from scratch. There was no army. Uh, there was nothing. And uh, we, were, we had guys driving out to the airport, unloading pallets of helmets or rifles or whatever got flown into the airport and bringing them out to a basic training site and outfitting the Afghan military and building it one battalion at a time, like 500 person groups, uh, battalion after battalion, trying to build an army uh, so that they could uh, take care of themselves. So that's where those first two pictures are from, those, that, that early effort to build a military. If you know anything about the military, it's not easy to build it quickly. It takes time to build an army and to professionalize it and to make it effective. Uh, this photo is from around 2017, 2018 time period. Just think about the difference in the body language of those people that you see in the top compared to the bottom in less than 20 years. That's the level at which their military got up to. And we'll talk about in the end what happened to their military, but I just want you to know what level that military got to in a very short amount of time. Uh, we had them training beside our most elite special operations forces uh, for really since 2002. Um, training with them, some here at Fort Bragg, training with them, working inside their units. We had really uh, good commandos inside their special forces. I think the most important part though is the military and the police were able to get to know their citizens. You know, and, and that was a great photo that was just floating around on Twitter. This soldier was sharing his meal with a local kid. That's the other thing, it's hard to build into a military. And we know from our last couple of years, it's hard to build that into a police department. Really connecting with your citizens, that is not easy to do. It takes a long time to learn to respect the citizens that you work for and for those citizens to respect you. So that's what that last image kind of goes to. The Afghans knew that, they had to get to that level. So their army was very, very loved, like our military is. We, we worked a lot on trying to build that same uh, professionalism into their army so that they would be loved. They got to the point with their special operations that they were doing missions that our most elite special operations forces do. 
without our help. We stopped even going with them. They were so good at it, like prison raids, doing things that, you know, you'll see a lot of our forces get valorous medals for. They were doing that stuff on their own by the end. That's how good their military got. So that will uh, explain how unfortunate it was what happened at the end. Their Air Force even got off the ground and got to a level that they could uh, hit 81% of the targets they were aiming at exactly on target, which is on very basic aircraft. And they're not flying F-16s and F-35s. This is some very basic stuff. They got really, really proficient. And I used that photo at the top uh, to show you how far their Army got in 19 years because I was given a briefing down at Central Command in Florida, and I was pre-briefing my uh, slide deck that I was taking down to show the generals down there to a colonel here at Fort Bragg who works over at JSOC. And that picture came up at the top and he said, you need to take that picture out. That's not the Afghan military. I said, yeah, it is. And he had to look at it for a while. He goes, no, those are my guys. I said, no, they're not. That's the Afghan military. That's the level in which they had gotten to that a guy who had worked with commandos for his whole career couldn't even tell the difference in a photograph. If it was our guys, that's how good their commandos were. And how do we get to here? That's what this, this discussion will be about. How did we get to building a strong military, starting to build a really good police force, having basically almost 20 years of democracy in a country where they knew individual freedoms, where women's had, women had all their rights, education was booming, uh, the literacy rate was climbing, the health rates are climbing. How do you get to... Uh, people throwing themselves at a wall at an airport and tossing their babies over the wall for somebody to grab and running down the runway beside our aircraft and hanging onto the outside of the aircraft and when it gets at 2,000 feet, falling off. How do you get there in months? That's what we're going to look at a lot today because that happened. That gap was months, not years, that we uh, had that problem. So... This kind of is a title I, I'm working on with a couple of books I'm writing right now. Afghanistan is, is really in America. It's a story of abandoning, of trust building, and then betraying, and then repeating. We did the same thing at, in the uh, end of the 1980s. The Afghans had learned to trust us, and then we abandoned them. We kind of betrayed them at the end and left them at the mercy of Pakistan, and then terrorists moved in there and the Taliban. Uh, and it all went to heck before we had to go back there. So that's the running story. We have just started that cycle again. We had gone in there in 2001 and two. That was our job to build trust again. And then at the end, we have betrayed them on our promises and we abandoned them. So that cycle is restarted. There is a terrorist organization running the country the size of Texas. So we're in that cycle. So why did we go to Afghanistan? You don't have to read all these. I'm going to kind of explain all of this, but I wanted some notes. If you wanted to be able to read it and think about it, and if you want, we can email the slides out to you afterwards. I like to do that. You can take this home and think deeply about it. But what were we trying to do, and what were the outcomes, and how did we get there? So three big missions when we went into Afghanistan. Find al-Qaeda, punish them, take revenge. September 11th, get al-Qaeda, bin Laden and his gang. Remove the Taliban regime, because they would not give us bin Laden. They wouldn't give us al-Qaeda. We asked them dozens of times. They wouldn't do it. So boost them out of power and let Afghans set their own new government up. And the last one was ensure terrorists don't come back and take it over. We had to do something. You know, the old, the old uh, uh, Colin Powell idea, if you break it, you buy it. You, know, you can't just walk in and stomp out a government, even if it's horrible, and then walk away and let it become a civil war you're going to be back there quickly. So the last piece, and this has been our, our national mission since the beginning, was to ensure the terrorists don't come back. And we as a nation, every single part of this country, failed on that last one really badly. We did find most of the Al-Qaeda guys. It took us a long time. We weren't getting a lot of help from Pakistan, where most of them went to hide. Uh, but we did pretty good getting rid of the Taliban regime. But we didn't hunt them down and kill them, uh, so they went to Pakistan and waited to come back, and eventually did. Uh, the last one, though, we really failed. We didn't set it up so the terrorists wouldn't, couldn't take over. Half of the so-called government in Afghanistan today are from a US-designated terrorist organization. One of them was number one you know, in the top 10 on the FBI wanted list. He's now in charge of part of the government in Afghanistan. So terrorists have taken over Afghanistan, lock, stock, and barrel. 
and that's where we're at today. Uh, so at the beginning, it was basically just direct combat for us, with or without Afghan partners. We were going in to find Al-Qaeda and, and remove the Taliban. Then we started working with the United Nations to help build some kind of basic governance. They had to have an election. They had to pick you know, a president. They had to have police. They had to have an army, a justice system, all those things that a, a, a nation has to have to exist. Otherwise, it's just uh, a space on the planet that nobody runs. It was not nation building. And this was something we laughed at sitting in Afghanistan in 2002 and three when we heard politicians or people on the news talking about, we shouldn't be nation building over there. We were not nation building. We never planned to, and we certainly never spent the money to do nation building. And I'll show you some comparisons between Korea, where we still have troops, and Afghanistan. And you tell me if we were nation building. Uh, it was not the plan. We literally were being told at the beginning, don't build anything permanent. We're not staying long. Do the minimum. Do what we need to do. So that is the opposite of nation building. If you've ever studied the Marshall Plan and see what we did after World War II to, to actually build nations. The big three, why did this not work? Our policy goal as a nation, the policy coming from our presidents and our Congress, never matched the goals that we set. We never had a policy that was going to lead us to where we wanted to be. And if you, it's like giving somebody bad directions to your Christmas party. Are they ever going to show up? If you live out in the woods and your phone doesn't work, no, they're never going to get there. And that's what we had. We had a bad set of instructions to get to where we wanted to be. That's, that's kind of the, the big one. We did not take on the most difficult tasks. There were some big, important tasks that we had to do to make this work, and we did not want to do them. Here in America, we didn't want to talk about them, and in that, in that part of the world, we didn't want to deal with it. So we didn't try to ignore it. You know what ignoring usually does. And the last thing, we didn't listen to Afghans. I was there in 2002 and three. I, I met the presidents, the vice presidents, the ministers of defense, the people running, building the police departments, uh, traveled all around the country, talked to governors, talked to local mayors. They told us what to do and what not to do. But what did the policymakers decide to do? What they thought was smart. And the Afghans basically shook their head for 19 years going, it's not going to work. But we didn't want to listen. Some of that's ego, some of that's you know, pride, I don't know. We just were bad at listening. That's probably not a surprise to you. So, I always got to have a map in my classes. That's important to me. But I don't put Afghanistan in color. You need to understand what this war was really all about. This country here between Afghanistan and India, this is what we were working with. This was the problem. And I said this to an ambassador in 2009 on his way to Afghanistan. I said, if you don't fix Pakistan, nothing else matters. That was my advice to him. Um, and he wrote back and said, yeah, I know, but we're not going to. Pakistan has 180 million people. It can't feed them. Its economy is in the dumper. And they have nuclear weapons. And they have a radicalism problem. And it's got 20 or 30 terrorist groups running around in it. And they hate India, and they're still technically at war with India. And they're fighting over that little spot at the top between India and Pakistan. Pakistan is a hot mess. Their military has taken over. They run the country. They have a government, but it really doesn't have any power. If they don't like the government after a while, they get rid of it. So Pakistan is the problem. That's where bin Laden was, right? That's where the Taliban really were born. That's where most of the terrorists hung out at. That's where they got trained. That's where they got armed. That's where they lived. That's where their family lived. While we were sitting on the other side of the border fighting the fighters that came over stayed for a little bit of time to make money because they got paid by Pakistan to go fight us. And Pakistan, meanwhile, is pretending to be a friend of the NATO alliance, which we're a member of, which should make us all a bit angry that they were pretending to be a friend of ours, really just to charge us rent for all the stuff we had to bring into the country via Pakistan. If you look at Afghanistan, how much water does it have? Zip. So everything has to come over land or by air. Afghanistan's a landlocked country. It has, when we went in, it had maybe 30 million people. It's got maybe 40 million today. Afghanistan is the size of Texas. It doesn't have a lot of people for its square footage. So people can get along pretty well there. It's not tight fit. In some of the cities, it's a little bit crazier. But it's not a super violent place. It's only violent where 
the terrorists showed up and caused violence. For most of the time in Afghanistan that we were there, you were safer in Afghanistan than you were in Washington, D.C. or Chicago. When it comes to murder rates on a whole. Think about that. You were safer in Afghanistan. I always felt safer in Afghanistan than I did in D.C. walking around at night. That's, that's the difference. Pakistan, hot mess. Afghanistan, workable. But if you have a neighbor like Pakistan, you're never going to have a stable Afghanistan. If you're trying to build a new country, you know, help Afghans build their own place and reset their, their government, and you've got a meddling neighbor who doesn't want it to happen. Pakistan doesn't want Afghanistan to be strong because that's the backyard of Pakistan. Their real enemy is India. So Pakistan never wanted a strong army behind it that's friendly with India. In foreign relations, every other country is friends with each other. Just a little thing to know about maps. So Pakistan was scared to death that Afghanistan, who gets along with India, might have a stable government that doesn't really like Pakistan because of all the terrorism problems and is friendly with India and has a strong army. And they told us that at the beginning. Don't build a big army. We don't want a big army over here. We, we do not want a large Afghan army behind us. That's going to be a problem for us in Pakistan. You don't really get a vote, but that was their, their view. So this is the issue. It's Pakistan. It's how do you deal with this country that is supposed to be your friend, but isn't. This is Afghanistan, mostly mountains and high deserts. Some of those mountains are up over 20,000 foot. So these make the Rockies look tiny. These are big mountains. This is the hardy people that live here. Um, and they are very industrious. They're very entrepreneur focused. They start a business in two seconds. Uh, and their starting business there is a little bit easier than in Virginia. So you can start a business quick. Um, they're, they're good at it. They're good at agriculture. They have some of the greatest fruit in the world. Uh, they are really good at producing things and making things. But they've been plagued with a government that goes in and out of power, that has terrorist groups come in and overthrow it. Uh, so it hasn't had a lot of stability in the last 45 years. So tough to make a living. But very uh, interestingly, highly focused on education kind of society. Education is important there. So the Taliban and Haqqani, uh, who are running the country now, have just thrown all the girls out of school um, and said that all the schools need to be changed to religious schools and stop teaching all this Western stuff. Uh, like science and economics, uh, they're, they're really anti-Afghan. Most of the Taliban and Haqqani culture is very Pakistani. It's not Afghan in culture. And that drives the Afghans crazy. These, these terrorists come in to run their country, and they don't even understand the culture because they, they were raised in Pakistan. So these are the six big reasons, I think, and there are many, many others. But these are the big six that come to me and why, we, why specifically um, NATO was defeated by Pakistan. And that's the way I, it is easier to look at this. Pakistan didn't want Afghanistan to succeed. They didn't want NATO to be there. They wanted NATO to leave, and they wanted to take over Afghanistan themselves with their proxy force called the Taliban and Haqqani Network. They are run by, funded by, supported by Pakistan. They wanted Afghanistan to be their backyard. And so uh, that's kind of the number one problem. We treated our enemy like an ally, uh, and that led to our defeat. And who was backing Pakistan financially? China. You think China was happy to see NATO lose? Yep. And who was also happy about this? Russia. So we had a lot going on that uh, we weren't willing to grapple with. And that's what I mean. We didn't want to do the hard things uh, and deal with the tough stuff when it came to Afghanistan. So we had the wrong policy, the wrong strategy, and really an outdated way of fighting a war. We were wanting to fight it one way, and it needed to be fought another, uh, and we couldn't get our head around that for a long time. We didn't listen to Afghans. Um, we, talked, we listened to a lot of Afghan experts that live around the world that get, make a living talking about Afghanistan but don't understand it or actually are paid by Pakistan sometimes to give advice about Afghanistan. All of our generals and ambassadors, the, senior, the most senior-level leaders, at no point in 20 years did they fall on their sword or their pen. Did they go back to the president and say, what you're asking me to do cannot be done if we don't do this and this. And you can either fire me or I'm going to leave, but it, we need to talk about this as a nation and fix it. And that was, I, I wrote an op-ed about that. It was actually uh, 
Nobody complained about it. Everybody agreed, but nobody wanted to say, you know what? And I advised a lot of these in generals and ambassadors. It is partly my fault, too. I never said to them, why don't you just offer your resignation? Let's make this a really big topic. If we're just going to kick the can down the road and keep sending people here to fight a war, maybe it's time that we get the Congress and the American people to talk about it. Uh, and I, I never thought to tell somebody to do that. And that kind of sticks in, in, in my own heart. It's something I could have done differently. But we didn't. You know, none of those generals or ambassadors offered to resign or told the president. You know, most of them didn't even get to talk to the president, to tell you the truth. Most of the presidents couldn't be bothered to have to talk to their ambassadors or their generals running a war. Think about that in comparison to World War II. Poor diplomacy regionally and internationally. Our diplomats who were working on uh, you know, a long-term peace process really fumbled the ball left and right. Uh, and no matter how much advice anybody gave them, they just kept on the same path they were on. And then at the end, we just got tired. And I had to explain this to you know, the Afghan president and the national security advisor and some of their ministers. Hey, no, really, everybody is tired in America. They're going to leave with everything. Everything. We're not leaving anything. They are, we're done. No president is going to lose an election by leaving Afghanistan and ignoring it. They're not. We have both parties run somebody saying, we're going to end this war, and we don't care. <laughs> and guess what? They both got elected. So it, the Afghans couldn't believe it. NATO actually didn't believe it. The NATO, our NATO partners didn't believe we would just abandon a country we've made all these security promises to. Uh, but we did. So that, that's kind of how it ended. This is how it flowed over a few years. And I just used kind of green, yellow, and red to help you think about how things were. At the beginning, 2001 and 2 and 3, kind of the liberation phase, we went in, helped Afghans push out the Taliban. They set up their own government. Things are pretty green at this point. Uh, there's a meeting in Bonn, Germany. The UN sits down and, and gets Afghans together. They they'd make this an international project. It's not just an American project. There are many nations working on Afghanistan. We start building an army and a police force. That army is born, and NATO actually starts to do more than just peacekeeping in the capital. We convince NATO, you need to send troops all over the country to help us stabilize this country so we can build the army faster so we can leave. So that, that phase, things are going pretty good. What's also going on at that time? What else? What's popular in America, not Afghanistan? The Iraq war buildup. I was in Afghanistan when watching the invasion of Iraq on television. That took all of the air out of the balloon in Afghanistan. Nobody in America, you couldn't even get people on the phone to talk about Afghanistan. They, DC was worried about the next war. So while things were going pretty good there, we couldn't get anybody to think about long term. It swiftly moves back to yellow. It starts to get bad. Uh, 04, 05, 06, 07, we have a full-blown insurgency coming in that we don't want to admit is happening. Um, and it's really an invasion by Pakistani-trained Taliban and Haqqani terrorists. They're coming in, and they are repopulating the country. And they are killing our guys. They're killing Afghans by the thousands, us by the hundreds each year. It's getting worse and worse. 2009, we get a new president. He says, well, we're going to, Afghanistan's the good war. We're going to leave Iraq and I'll go fix Afghanistan. It is pretty ugly when we get there. I was in there. I was General McChrystal's aide when we went through Capitol Hill and went into the country. This was a hot mess of hot messes. This was a painful thing to look at and figure out, is there even a way to turn this around? It is so bad right now. We wrote up a way to turn it around. We got NATO to buy into it. We got about half of what we needed from the president. Again, we don't always get the presidents to care about what's going on. Uh, but that does lead to what we need. It stunts the Taliban advances. It slows Pakistan down. Pakistan realizes, oh, man, we're not going to get rid of these people quick. They're going to be here a while longer. So Pakistan actually loses morale. The Taliban lose morale. We go back into a yellow zone. Um, we're fighting right beside the Afghan military. We're making it really large really quickly. And we're putting them out in the fight. And things are going good. The Taliban are falling back over those next few years. So 2014, things have been going so well that NATO changes its mission. We don't, we don't want to do combat anymore. We're going to let the Afghans do all the combat. We're going to shift over to training and advising and assisting. So we go back to where we were in 2001 and 2. 
we're just going to help you keep your army growing and your air force growing and your police growing, but we're pulling back from combat operations. And we start downsizing. Things are going well. The Taliban and Pakistan are really on their heels. They think, man, this is going to work. We've got to figure out a way to beat them because their, their army is actually pretty good. They are killing the Taliban everywhere. It gets so good in 2018 and 2019, the Taliban's annual offensive that they launched every year in the spring utterly failed. They couldn't get it off the ground, which was a big change. That's when you know there's a big shift in a war when they launch their normal offensive and it doesn't work. And the Taliban knew it and Pakistan knew it. And we finally got the Taliban to enter a ceasefire. If you know anything about how wars end, there's usually ceasefires where you stop killing each other for a few days, for a few weeks, for a few months. So by 2018, without any promises of anything else, they entered into ceasefires with the Afghan government. And we had a number of those. Things are looking pretty good. Uh, we get another president into office. He wants to leave immediately. We talk him into letting this keep going green for a while because that's going to be bad if we pull out when you finally hit a high point. Um, he struggles with that throughout his term, allows us to downsize to just the right counterterrorism footprint and the right training and advising footprint. Just enough people that we can keep it all in the green. We can keep moving forward. Unfortunately, he picks an ambassador to lead the peace talks that have been underway for a while. We started those back in 09 under a mission I was on. So that's just coming to fruition. By 2020, we actually have uh, an agreement with the Taliban. It's poorly written. It does what it needs to do, but it leaves a lot of holes. It leaves a lot of gaps. And the Taliban and Pakistan find their way to come back. Fourth quarter. I watch Southeastern Conference football, the only good football conference. Fourth quarters are important in football, right? Especially in the SEC. People score 40 points. It's crazy. The Taliban and Pakistan see that. At that very end, when things are all green, and then Biden comes into office and says, I want to end the war too, and by the way, I'm pulling everybody out. Against all military advice, against, and I sat through all these briefings, against all the advice of everybody to say, you've got to keep it going. Don't, don't pull the plug completely. And certainly don't pull away their aviation mechanics, their intelligence assistants, the people who help them to get fuel to the... You can't pull the logistics out from under them. It's like telling your kids to go on a, a road trip, but you drain the, the tank of, of gas before they go. And they're only going to get out of the driveway. They got no gas. You know, kids never have any money. So we made that kind of ultimate decision. We, we signed a deal that you could have worked with, and instead of renegotiating the deal and holding the Taliban and the, the Haqqanis to, uh, to the promises of the deal, which they were not keeping, uh, Biden doubled down on it and pulled everything out all at once. And that started, that decision came out in May of this year, and that started the, the dominoes falling. When we announced, even NATO was surprised with what we announced. I was getting calls from NATO members going, what, everything? You're not helping in any way. All the security promises, you're breaking them. Yep, everything. And that was it for the Afghans. They knew they couldn't do this on their own. NATO never fought Pakistan. How were the Afghans going to fight Pakistan? minus the 51 nations that used to be behind them. So that was kind of how it quickly, in months, went from green to red. And um, a lot of that was just people being tired and it, having no political consequences. I don't think this is going to affect the next presidential election. On either party, it won't. So that is one of the issues. Pakistan wasn't an ally. And I'll, you could just read through some of these things. Pakistan did a lot of horrible things all through that time. I, Pakistan doesn't like me personally. This is going online. They'll, they'll probably try to do some more cyber attacks on me. But Pakistan has done some horrible things to us uh, besides, you know, literally killing our own troops, killing our forces at different moments. But they created the Taliban Haqqani terrorist group. They're kind of a, the, the Haqqanis are an arm of their army. Um, that's who we were fighting. They, they were funding that. Safe havens, weapons, leadership training, money, radicalization, keep cranking out young kids that don't know any better and only want to go kill people. Um, helping a, an Afghan right now who luckily, who went through that radicalization in Pakistan and luckily got pulled aside by somebody and uh, stopped him from becoming a future suicide bomber. Uh, he ended up being a colonel and flying aircraft in the Afghan army. Uh, there are a lot of kids on that, on that path and Pakistan was definitely 
send them down the wrong path. So that was what they were doing. They, they were keeping bin Laden safe. If you've never read the 600-page report about that, you should. It's free online. Somebody leaked it. But the Pakistanis did their own study of how was bin Laden hanging out by the Pakistani West Point for all these years. It was pretty obvious. Pakistan didn't want a stable Afghanistan. Pakistan has four provinces, if you remember on that map. Pakistan is very narrow as a country. It's just a strip of land. They want that backyard, that Afghanistan as a fifth province, that they can rule through proxies so that they are never stuck fighting a war with India, because they're still at war with India, and in their minds, that's the only thing that matters, on this little tiny narrow strip of land. They need that backyard. So they feel pretty confident. Pakistan is very happy today. They feel like they have a fifth province right now. They are pushing to get international recognition for the current regime sitting in Kabul, because they want that to be their fifth province. They want to run it like another state inside of Pakistan. Pakistani army runs the country. That's kind of a problem. Usually when, when that happens, you don't have good things in the country. They wanted us out. Pakistan would rather be friends with China than America. People don't know that. Why would they want to be friends with China? China's running concentration camps against their, their Muslim faith people, all right? The Uyghurs are in camps in China, possibly a million of them sitting in camps. Why would Pakistan, this Muslim country, it was born on being a Muslim country, want to be friends with China? And I had a Pakistani general tell me, one of their intelligence officers in 2020, they don't care about human rights, so we don't get any beef from them. All the stuff we do, they don't care. So they're our friend. They're our iron brother. That's how they refer to each other. So China and Pakistan, very, very tight, and that works out fine for Pakistan. Pakistan never wanted that large army, and Pakistan really was, all the way through all the peace negotiations to try to get this war to end in a responsible way was the guide helping the, the terrorists all the way through the negotiations. That was Pakistan's role. They were having meetings at their State Department equivalent, guiding them through the whole thing, making sure they knew how to beat us in diplomacy, which doesn't take much most days. We had the wrong policy, wrong strategy. We never really had an end state. Where do we want to get, what's our goal? What are we going to get out of this? How do we know when we're done? These are questions that were asked many, many times over 20 years, and nobody really ever gave much of an answer. So without that, you're really stuck. You, you, you've invited a bunch of people to your Christmas party, but none of them are going to get there. And that's kind of where we were for 20 years. We never were committed to a long-term, let's say, Korea style, right? When did we go into Korea? When did we start helping train Korean troops? The 1940s. 1940s. We're still there. We never committed to that in any sense of the word that we commit to that long term of a policy. And I'll show you some, how that compares in a minute. We never stopped Pakistan. We never did. If your policy doesn't stop the really bad actor in the war, then your war isn't going to work out very well. So that's a pretty, pretty simple one. China, Russia, and Iran, and I, I met with all their ambassadors in the first couple of years and their military leaders that were in, in Kabul, they never worked with us. <laughs> they, Iran did for the invasion, just because they hated Al-Qaeda too, um, in some ways. But after that, they basically told us, oh, no, we're going to watch you, we're going to watch you struggle. We're not here to help. You can count on us not to help you. And so they didn't. For 19 years, they worked against us behind the scenes any way they could, but they did not help. Um, and they're the three big countries in that area we needed really to get help from. They're all involved now, and they want us to keep sending money to them to help fix Afghanistan. But now that they can swoop in and steal a lot of the uh, minerals and resources, they're all interested in Afghanistan and its security. Um, when we had a chance to do something with information operations, this was really a battle of narratives. We had to convince the Afghan people who was going to win, and we never really got good at that. And we never really tried. The Taliban were very good at that. And they had a really important uh, assistant in that information operations in, in telling that narrative. The Pakistanis and the Taliban and the Khani, they had the entire worldwide media system on their side. They didn't know it, but they were helping them. They fed them information every day that they could use in propaganda to convince Afghans things weren't going well. How many news stories did you read about the Afghan military doing well? You won't raise your hand. How many did you read about everything going badly in Afghanistan every day? 
And whether that was the truth or that was the spin of that particular media outfit, it was out there. And so that information, we, most Americans didn't care about it that much. I'll tell you, I, I've talked about Afghanistan for 19 years. Most people fall asleep. Um, this has not been a big top drawer issue for America. Uh, it hasn't been more important than a Super Bowl or the World Series or whatever else is important to most people. It hasn't risen to importance. So all of that information was just going to one group of people who really cared about it, and that's the Taliban and, and uh, Pakistan. They used that against us. So the free press has, uh, it has a blade on both sides of the knife. We were slow to recognize the insurgency. It was happening, but we didn't get our heads around it. And that's important. Information operations are important in an insurgency. So that, that made it really hard for us to dig ourselves out. And we were slow to build the army. Afghans told us, we're going to need a big army quick, because you're not going to stay long. And if we don't have a large force that we can professionalize quickly, then we're, going, we're not going to be able to take on Pakistan. We were like, what do you mean, fight Pakistan? Yeah, we're going to have to fight Pakistan when you leave because they're going to use their proxies to invade us and take over. And we didn't believe them. Um, and we treated Afghan leaders poorly in public. We, if you wonder why sometimes Afghan leaders said bad things about America, you should have heard what was being said the other way uh, by our Congress members, by our Senate, by our diplomats, by uh, people sitting in the White House. So in a country where your standing and your honor is important, that's a real kick in the teeth to have your supposed ally beating you up all the time, saying you're corrupt, saying you're this, saying you're that. You, know, you can imagine what that would, would do over time. We didn't listen to the right Af Afghans. <laughs> we didn't listen to the right Afghan experts. There are people who made a living talking about Afghanistan, who got paid, academics, think tank people, you name it. it just get gobs of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars to talk about it every year. They didn't know what they were talking about. But unfortunately, in Washington, D.C., a lot of those people get into the White House, and they get into the State Department, and they get into the Defense Department, and they tell them things that are actually aren't helpful. And so while we were sitting in Afghanistan trying to tell our own capital what needed to be done, we were fighting against all these people that didn't know what they were talking about, who had the ear of the President or the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of State. That happened over and over again under both every administration, both political parties. So this, this ignoring and just letting it go, you know, it's almost an apathy. Afghans are telling us something. Why do they keep repeating that? Maybe it's important. But we, we refuse to really listen to it, uh, as it as it goes on. The one thing that really tripped us up at the end, and they kept telling us, um, you have to let us lead diplomacy. If you get ahead of us in diplomacy and reaching out to our enemies, they're going to use that against us. And they did. Badly. I mean, that, that was really the, the, the nails in the coffin at the end for the Afghan government. We got so far ahead of them in diplomacy um, that they couldn't, they couldn't get their arms around it and, and be proactive anymore. And the Taliban hung them with that rope. And we kept feeding the rope to the Taliban. And that was really ugly to see. And a lot of people saw it coming and were advising to stop it, but we couldn't stop ourselves. The diplomats wanted a peace deal on our side more than our enemy did. What happens if you want a deal more than the other guy? You're going to pay a big price. How many of you all walk into a car dealership and say, I'll take that car, whatever you make me pay for it? Well, you're going to get a $100,000 Hyundai. That's what we did on our diplomacy towards the end. We were paying millions of dollars to drive a Corolla. And, and the, the other side knew that. And the Afghans warned us about that repeatedly. And I warned people about that repeatedly. I could say, you need to stop. But we didn't. They told us not to do things that are going to cause disunity. Their country, a lot like America, has lots of different regions in it. Um, you know, so they have a lot of different people of different heritage, different ethnic makeups. They still have some tribal systems in certain areas. So there's a lot of disunity, just like in America. I mean, 50% of this country votes one way or the other, right? We're pretty evenly divided. In Afghanistan, it's divided too, just like every other country in the world. But we did things that made it worse, and they warned us to stop doing those things. Um, now, they weren't very good at it politically either, as America has been leading the way on how to do politics that divides people. They're, the rest of the world watches how we do democracy, and they repeated that as well. There were a lot of, you're seeing that around the globe right now. We, we have a lot of divisive candidates running for office around the globe. So that kind of added to it. I don't know if. Our, our 
Um, the actions we took made it any worse. You know, they, they were not helping either. This one irks me, I think, the most as I look back on it. I don't think I can, and I worked with dozens of generals and dozens of ambassadors from different countries uh, from our own country over the years. I don't think there's any of them that didn't understand the problem. And I think all of them realized that they didn't have the resources to do what they were being asked to do. <clears throat> but none of them really risked their career to say, stop, I'm going to go to Congress and talk to them. Mr. President, if you don't want to hear it from me, I'm going to go talk to Congress and the press. You can fire me if you want. But we need to have a discussion about this. It's not going to work. And that didn't happen. And that, that one kind of frustrates me the most, because these are people we pay to be blunt. Now, I'm giving a pretty blunt delivery here. So I've been paid to, to say things as they are. That has been my job. As, as a military officer, you, or you get paid to say really uncomfortable things to people. You can find a diplomatic way to do it, but in the end, you need to say what the heck is going on. And, and we kind of miss that. And our diplomats uh, certainly miss that, too. The ambassadors knew the diplomatic approach we were taking wasn't going to work, but they, they, they kept letting it go anyways. And nobody, nobody said, you know what, I will, I'd rather be fired, I'd rather resign than keep letting this go forward. I need to make a stop as a nation and reevaluate and figure out what we need to do. Uh, so that last piece there, you know, that everybody knew Pakistan was the problem, that's probably the most frustrating. We all knew that Pakistan was the problem the real source of all the issues, and we didn't do anything about it. We truly just said, maybe it'll get better. Trump was the first president to really kind of put the screws to Pakistan and see if he could make them change their mind. Uh, but then he took the screws back out. And, and so Pakistan did what they always do. They go right back to what they want to do, because they don't care. It's just, they don't care what happens to us. They want to make their own part of the world work for them. That's how it works. So I think that's, that's probably one that most quickly could have changed some of the things that were going on. But go back and read the headlines. Read the congressional reports. Even if they did say negative things about Afghanistan, nobody in America listened. Nobody in the Congress or the press really went, wait a minute, what did they say? I can say, what did he say? They were all, they were all men. What did he say? Why is he saying that? And have a bigger discussion about how do we get this right. That poor diplomacy at the end, that was, that was kind of the nail in the coffin. You can win all the battles in the war. You can build a, a military to replace you when you're gone. You can have a new government. You can have a democracy with elections. But if you diplomatically end the war wrong, it, none of it matters. The other side will still win if you don't end it correctly. And that one it was really tough for the Afghans. And, that, and I was getting the feedback for, at the end from the Afghan president's office and the, from the minister of defense and and the, the guy running the police, the Minister of Interior, they were like, why are you undercutting us? Why do you keep undermining us diplomatically? Like, what is this? Do you, do you hate us? Do you want us to fail? How can we run the country after what you're doing to us right now? And they, were, they were just crushed that we would do this to them. That's that betrayal kicking in. We had betrayed them before. After they helped us get rid of the Soviets and helped the Soviet empire collapse, we left and told them to figure it out yourselves. This all came back in 2020 and in 2021. The Afghans were really going, why are you doing this to us? Did, did we do something to make you hate us? Like, you're really hurting us. So in the end, all of that helped the enemies of Afghanistan, to, kind of elevated them in the diplomatic world. They were, being, they were the ones going to different capitals and holding conferences, and the Afghan government was being left out of it. And we could have demanded they were part of it, but we didn't. That's hard. We don't like to do hard things when it comes to Afghanistan. We failed miserably to counter uh, Russia and China. We never pulled a coalition of Muslim nations together to really put pressure on Pakistan to change what they're doing uh, and to stop funding terrorism. We still have it today. We do not have huge sanctions on Pakistan right now for funding terrorism, even though they just defeated NATO with it. Uh, and at the end, though, the Afghans failed really heavily, and I was trying to push them to get more involved on the diplomatic side because I had been part of the start, the launch of this. I knew the lead ambassador. I was with him in 09 when we started talking about this. I said, you've got to take ownership. The world will pass you by if you don't get proactive on the diplomatic issues. These diplomats want peace really badly, and they don't care how bad they're going to sell you to get it. Uh, but the Afghans just felt so 
uh, dejected by the end. They, they couldn't even get into the game. Uh, so that was kind of the end of the diplomacy piece. And at the end, the, the last one, NATO just got tired. There wasn't a NATO country that was going, you know what, I, just, I think we're going to need to stay 20, 30 more years. I mean, they weren't. Every country was right where we were. They didn't want to say it first. They wanted America to lead NATO out of Afghanistan. They didn't want to be the one to, to lead themselves out. But that's where we were. None of them wanted to stay at the very beginning. I mean, we were twisting their arm in 2002 to actually do more. And NATO nations were like, well, I've sent you 20 guys. Isn't that enough? We're going to need more than 20 people. So they never really wanted to be there. This was kind of the easy way out. No, no nation, just like America, was willing to go back and really tell the capital, their leaders, hey, this is what's happening in Afghanistan, and we're going to need more fast, or it's not going to work. Like, those discussions didn't happen. NATO made a lot of promises to, Af to our citizens and to Afghan citizens that they weren't planning on keeping. Not good for an alliance. You need to keep your word, right? I think most citizens in NATO nations never really understood the war. If, tell me if you really feel confident that you understood what was going on in Afghanistan in the last 20 years. Raise your hand if you, you knew what was happening. And that's been the same case as I've been traveling around the country talking about different things. This is not, it was never a big important issue. We'll see in a minute what that's going to lead to, but it just wasn't. I don't think politicians or our generals or ambassadors really explained it in clear, concise terms. I, I've helped prepare and read some of these statements that they would give to Congress. They're long, and they're riddled with all kinds of caveats and ways to, like nobody just walked in and said, it's going to crap. It is, full stop, let's talk about it. No one wanted to do that. Is that risks? That's, that's risk. Uh, so that really never happened. And the last part, drives me crazy, because I've talked about this to the press many times in different think tanks over the year. We give away too much information. I just wrote an article about this uh, in, in my column, you know, that loose, li loose lips still sink ships. We gave away every bit of information our enemy needed to know for the entire war. The, the, the Taliban and Haqqani in Pakistan, they didn't have spies all over NATO. They didn't need spies running all over the country trying to find out what's going on to the Afghan military so they could write propaganda against it. We wrote it every day in the press. We put it out in government publications. We had watchdog groups. We had think groups. We had congressional reports. Every single day, some piece of info came out in English and sometimes in foreign languages to make it easier for them to get it. And they just used it. They read the headlines. They rewrote it as Taliban propaganda, and they handed it out. That's easy. Someone's doing all the research for you. It's very easy to run an information operations program. Our press didn't want to admit that's what they were doing, but they were. If you go back to World War II and look at how the press functioned in relation to the war, and we were trying to do this in numerous countries, go in, throw out a regime, put in a new government, build a police force. We did that in North Africa, up the way through Europe, across Europe, all through the Pacific. We were doing this, country by country. All these little small invasions and build up a force and move on. We did that for, for years, and then with the Marshall Plan for decades. Um, but we had a tight lid on information, because you have to. We don't, we don't understand that anymore. And that's really the really bad way to fight a war. We do not get it anymore. So let me give you a good example, and then we'll go into question and answer. I like to compare what happened in the Korean War and what's happening in South Korea with Afghanistan. Because I was, I was in there at the beginning when this started, and, and I as I went back and studied Korea, I was blown away by the differences. So Korea, China is backing the North Korean forces and Russia, but China mostly to fight South Korea and a UN coalition. Sound familiar? Coalition of good guys against an enemy that's backed by China. 21 countries, that's who's in there. Afghanistan, China's backing Pakistan to fight against Afghans and us. Now it's NATO instead of the UN. And now we have 51 countries in our coalition. Seems like the stakes must be higher, right? We're, this is important. It wasn't. We had more people in our group, but it was much less important. We never got across what, what was at stake here. Can anybody tell you, tell you think about the difference? What, what's at stake in South Korea? What happens if South Korea doesn't have us for 80 years to help protect them? They'll cease to exist, right? 
They'll, North Korea will come roll south and they'll take over the country. It'll be a bloodbath. What's happening in Afghanistan right now? We pulled out. Taliban and Haqqani roll in with Pakistan support and they're hunting down and killing anybody who doesn't think like them. It's the same scenario, just in different parts of Asia and different time period. And maybe today in this world, people don't want to fight a war like Korea. We don't want to stay security partners with somebody forever. Maybe that's the new new. We've still got troops in Italy, in Germany, in the Philippines, all over Europe, Korea. That's from World War II. The Philippines is a little bit before World War II. That's going back to the turn of the century, the last century. So maybe we're just not in the mood to do that anymore, to put that kind of effort into something. I don't know how we have a, a debate about this and make it right. So for the whole time that South Korea has had our security involvement, the 1940s through now, it's been a near dictatorship. I'll show you a chart of when democracy becomes important in South Korea, if you don't remember how that started. The invasion force was just a battalion in, F in Korea, about 600 folks, the famous Task Force Smith. It got up to almost 2 million troops on the ground in Korea. And that early effort, the early military assistance group to build the Korean military so we could leave, they started that same program. We're going to build up the Korean army so that we can leave. They had 920 officers working on that at the beginning. I was one of nine in Afghanistan. Were we nation building? Were we serious about what we were doing? We went in with private, and I'm being generous, there wasn't quite a thousand. There were other forces that followed in. The invasion was pretty quick with some CIA and special operations teams. That was quick and painless, mostly Afghans on the ground doing the work. We were doing the air uh, and guiding and, and helping them and, and doing some of the uh, counterterrorism direct action stuff. We only got up to 130,000, pretty, pretty small footprint if you compare it to Korea. I didn't look at the square footage of Korea. Is Korea the size of Texas, South Korea? Anybody been there? It's, think about that. <laughs> 130,000 for the, the size of Texas. And there were only nine of us. That was what was assigned to the U.S. Embassy to build the Afghan army. Nine folks. We all knew each other pretty well. You know, lieutenants, sergeants, and two-star generals, you know, hanging out in the same room, because that's it. We eventually got, you know, maybe 150 as the year went on. We, we expanded. Think about that. A hundred times larger in Korea. That's the amount of effort we knew. If we're going to build an army quick enough that can sustain Korea's safety and security, uh, we're going to need more people. And then in the end, we never left Korea. We still stayed there. So this is what it looks like on a really cool chart with colors. At the top, you get South Korea. Starts 1950-ish, right? There's three years of war. We sign an armistice with the enemy. South Korea doesn't. Actually, it's the same thing that happened at the end of Afghanistan. We signed a deal, an armistice with the Taliban. The Afghan government didn't. We have the autocratic ruler. <laughs> it's mostly red in Korea, right? Then there's an uprising. There's a military coup. Then you have political repression. Then you get a dictator who's assassinated. Then you get a coup. Then you have another ruler. It's not until 1987 you get your first non-dictator. Wait a minute. Afghanistan, from day one, has a elected and appointed president and cabinet ministers, and then they put in a legislature within the next year, and then they have three political elections for the presidency. There's democracy. There's human rights being respected the whole time, 20 years. Compare that. But Korea is somehow worth investing long term in, and maybe it's just a different time in the world today. Maybe human beings don't care that much about long-term promises and investments anymore. The promise means nothing anymore. Apparently, it meant something in Korea. I'll tell you, when President Trump said, I'm pulling all the troops out of Afghanistan and Iraq and maybe Korea, you should have seen how folks in Korea were acting, especially on the military side. Our military. What? what, 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 what? We can't do that. What would happen? Well, after Afghanistan fell, at the end, when that democracy came crashing down in months because we pulled everything out, I pulled some Korea and China experts together in my 
my studio with some scotch and said, what would happen if we did the same thing in South Korea? If we pulled every single thing out, every bit of support, and they said, we'd never do that. I said, what if we did? Because we just did it. We just did it with a NATO alliance of 51 countries. But what if we did it in South Korea? And they all took another drink of scotch and said, three days. Three days before that government would collapse. Because that northern army is big. And if we took everything, and we never flew another air mission, and we never launched a rocket, we never sent a missile, and we just said, you got this. They said the South Korean army would freeze. Because they don't think like us. One example, they said, look, it, you still need to get an order from a general to move a car in the parking lot. They think slowly about war. They do their South Korean military tests and rehearsals and drills and practices in a format that ensures they're going to win. And they're not allowed to change the format so they might lose. They assume they'll always win because we're there. We're there with them. So they'll always win. Well, Afghans thought we'd always be there too. And they'd always be able to win but we weren't. So I come back to this, this comparison, because I just think it's striking. Who do you keep your promises to? Is South Korea that much more important than Afghanistan was? They're both backed by China. So you're dealing with the same master who's, who's backing the, the bad guys in this scenario. Which one's more important? That's kind of where we ended up. 20 years of democracy gone in months. Decades of dictatorship finally turns into a democracy at the tail end, and we're still there. So maybe we were investing more because we wanted them to be a democracy one day. Afghans peaked too early. Outcomes. A NATO plus coalition much bigger than the, US, the UN coalition in, in Korea was defeated by Pakistani-backed terrorists. We were. That's the answer. That's what happened. NATO defeat. This is the first defeat by NATO since we've had that. Pakistan, China, Russia, Iran, all happy right now. Very happy. They learned a lot from what just happened. This was hybrid warfare. and They were all watching. They were playing. They were messing with us, right? Russia's been working really hard, and China as well, to, to divide our own population against each other. They learned a lot from what just happened over there. The US has angered our NATO partners. I did get a lot of emails from our NATO partners going, I feel like we've been lied to. This isn't what we, we were told the, the uh, withdrawal was going to look like. This is a d disaster. This is a debacle. And you started it, U.S. We followed you, but you started it, and we feel a bit betrayed. So Afghans uh, and NATO partners are not very happy with us. I was really surprised at some of the messages I got, and I compared notes with other people. They're like, yeah, and a lot of NATO countries are very angry right now with America. It's not good when your big NATO-friendly alliance is mad at you. Other nations watch this total abandonment and do not trust us. I am watching headlines every single day, people wondering if they can trust U.S. security promises. Different nations going, I don't know. I don't know anymore. Because that one seemed like a lock-in. 20 years of democracy, and they're going to stay there to make sure that it takes hold, and then they leave all at once. I don't know if I can trust them. So that is a big topic of discussion, especially in the Middle East right now. They're all really wondering if America is going to be there when they need it. That makes Iran happy, that makes Russia happy, that makes China happy. Because they'd all like to meddle in those countries and steal the resources. So we've lost international standing. Terrorists have been emboldened. There were terrorist messages coming in from around the globe congratulating the Taliban and Haqqani Network for defeating America. Pakistan was smiling right there behind them. And now Afghanistan's run by a terrorist group. It is a humanitarian disaster. We're seeing starvation already in the hospitals. The economic system has completely collapsed. The food system has collapsed. The Taliban are worried about hunting down and killing anybody that was friendly with NATO and the United Nations. And they've basically, I'm not kidding, an Afghan leader, or a Taliban leader, went on television and said, we didn't promise we'd bring you food. You better pray to God. We just promised to take over the country. So that's what you get when a terrorist organization takes over the capital of a country. That, was no, honest, that is a true quote from them. We didn't promise to feed any of you Afghans, so you better pray for food. That's where we're at right now. And we're going into winter, 
and remember, it's 20,000 feet in a lot of Afghanistan. Winter's nasty, and it kills people. That's what's happening. And I, I was talking to somebody the other day at lunch who has foster children, and I was trying to think about how do I explain, you know, they said, what happened in Afghanistan? This was in last month. I said, well, let me give you an analogy that you might understand. At age six, you bring in two foster children. And you said, I'm going to take care of you. At age 10, they're starting to trust you. They've overcome that initial, I don't know who these people are. They're not my real mom and dad. But by age 10, they start to trust you, and they love you. And you're starting to talk about adoption. But you're going to really be there for them. You want to take these kids in. And then by the time they're 15, they're thinking about learning how to drive. And you said, next year, we're going to adopt you. When you turn 16, we're going to make it official. We're always going to be there for you. And then at age 16, you're still just talking about adoption. You haven't really done it. And then at age 17, they're almost legal. They're almost legal adults. And they're worried that maybe you've been lying to them, that you're not going to be adopted at some point. And then at age 18, you say, get out of here. Leave my house. I don't owe you anything. I've done all I need to do for you. And don't come back to me if you need help. And then at age 19, they're on the streets. They get raped. They get beaten. One of them's tortured. One of them is murdered, and you just pretend like they're not your problem, and you don't even know them. That's how Afghans feel right now. They feel like those foster kids, because they just went through this whole cycle with us for two decades, from not trusting us at all, and believe me, I was there in 02. They did not trust us, and why would they? And we earned their trust through a lot of blood, and a lot of sweat, and a lot of tears back here when families lost their loved ones. The military went over there and earned the trust of the Afghan people. And then our political leaders said, doesn't matter, you're on your own. I don't know you, don't ask me for anything. And they are, and Afghans are being raped and tortured and beaten and murdered right now. And we said, good luck with that. We're not even gonna take you in if, if we promise you. We had handed a lot of Afghans a piece of paper that basically said, for your service to us, we will let you become US citizens one day. There's about 100,000 of them sitting in Afghanistan right now, and we can't get them out. I spent months working with people in groups trying to get them out of there. So I mean, not, uh, this isn't just a, a story about how we've done this. We've done this, uh, and that is where Afghans are at right now. They are crushed, and not just America abandoned them. A 51 NATO coalition, nation coalition, abandoned them. That's, that's a lot to take. Imagine if you were a foster kid, and you, not just your your foster parents said, get the heck out of here, but the church you went to as well said, don't come back to this church either. We're done with you. Good luck. That's where they're at. So that is the journey uh, from where we started in Afghanistan to where things ended. Because Once we said we were going to leave, the Afghans lost all hope. And they didn't really have any reason to have hope, to tell you the truth. So um, I'll take your questions now. That's not all the reasons that things didn't go right. Those are the big ones that jumped out at me for 19 years of looking at this and talking to people about it and really listening to Afghans. I talk to Afghans probably 15 times a day. They message me through all kinds of social media. We share questions. I help them write articles. They write articles. I help them publish them. I've helped them publish books. Like I listen to Afghans. That's what I was paid to do to understand. That's where they are. Um, so this picture went viral uh, this week in Afghanistan. This girl had come from a nice family and they were doing really well, but with the economic collapse, her and her sister were on the street begging, um, you know, running car to car, asking people for money. And so her picture got out and it's a pretty remarkable picture, right? That's, you'd see that and you'd want to help her. Uh, so that kind of went viral and, and a lot of groups came together, nonprofit groups, to, uh, to make sure she could have school supplies and food uh, and get her off the streets. So she's pretty happy now, but that's who we left behind. And her promise was she was going to be able to grow up and get an education and do whatever she wanted in life. And that's gone. She's now stuck at home. So We're going to have microphones if you want to walk to them. I can repeat your question. This isn't a big room. I'll probably be able to hear you fine. But I'll take your questions. Rules are simple. Just ask a question. A lot to say about Afghanistan, but do ask a question so we can help. You don't. You can just raise your hand. I can call on you. Go ahead, sir.
Yeah, it is, it is very tough. And I, I don't say, that, I don't fault them. I'm not calling out. I know a lot of these generals, you know, we're like friends on Facebook. I've known a lot of these guys for a long time. We were all younger when this started, so they, they were not generals when I first knew them. They didn't do anything cowardly or wrong. I think there's just not a mechanism anymore for them to truly say what's on their mind and be listened to. Now, General Marshall in World War II, I'm a big Marshall fan and Marshall scholar, um, he could go in and talk to the president anytime he wanted to. You know, he was running the war from D.C. You know, our wartime commanders were always in Afghanistan or in um, Tampa, Florida. So they couldn't go and just say, I'm coming in to see the president. You know, if they had that relationship, I think it would be better. We've really put a big chunk of space between our generals and the president. It's the commander in chief, but there's so many layers of people that have to have to get through before that commander of a war in a country, you know, that's, that's leading 100,000 people from different nations can get to that president, it's mind boggling. Um, I think you, you might, maybe some congressional mandates that require that presidents have a quarterly meeting with commanders, combatant commanders around the world, sit down with them one on one. The president's not gonna do it on his own because they're busy and their schedule's full and they don't wanna work one more hour a day. And, and their staff is never going to squeeze them in. It's just not going to happen. That's not the priority anybody that gets a president elected wants is a war. Those people around a president are not interested in helping him understand. The, they they want to be, be done with wars and get on to other topics. So I'm going to pop back to this one over here. Thank you so much. It has been a long time to wait for somebody to come and explain what Pakistan do in Afghanistan. And that's the reality we all have to face. Unfortunately to me, it's not only the matter of how we fought. I'm so grateful we are out of there, all against the wish of some people. When I walk to Aunt Nabarin and I see somebody doesn't have a limb, that's enough. In the small little town of Aberdeen, I see people without limb and walking. That war, to begin with, was a very bad war. It should have been done completely differently. Listening to a professor of uh, philosophy and theology, he said the Western nation today become a philanthropic money laundering. We spent $81 billion in Afghanistan. What happened? I'm hungry here. I won't tell you all. You should be very happy we are out of Afghanistan. We cannot commit genocide to kill every of those damn Taliban over there. If they do not become, defend their nation and accept the democracy, we cannot do that. It has been repeated time after time. Hitler did not succeed it. Do you have a question for the audience? Real My quick? question is that, is that correct? That the corruption in both sides, in the Western side and in Afghanistan, spend a tremendous amount of money, drain the economy of this nation. Is that true? Do you have an answer for it? Okay, corruption, that's a good question. Uh, I don't list corruption on here as one of the big problems because I've been to Chicago, I've been to New Orleans, and I've been to D.C. There's corruption all over this country, nasty corruption. That's how people get elected. So corruption in Asia is even worse, but it's normal in lots of parts of Asia. So the corruption, is it bad? Yeah. Did it damage things? Yeah. Did it, is it a game changer in this? No. Everybody is used to corruption in Afghanistan and Pakistan and India. That's pretty much normal for the neighborhood. That's, that's not a big stunning thing. It angers you because of the amount of money, but that's not the difference maker in this. Uh, if you don't stop the guy who's creating the bad guys, if you don't turn off the water spigot, is the bathtub going to keep overflowing? Yeah. If you never turn off the water spigot, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the water was clean, if the water was dirty, if it's corrupt, if it's, it doesn't matter. The water is still flowing out of the bathtub. So it's an issue. 
it was bad. There are problems with it. It's frustrating. But I don't sit around worrying about money. I worry about lives. And that's what's more important to me. And I think that's probably the, the biggest issue. Yes, sir. I think, I don't know if it's our decline as much as it's the rest of the world moving up uh, and us not caring so much about being in first place anymore. I don't know if that's what's causing the decline, but we, we truly, there were many moments in time when other nations came to us. And I, I worked in, in Kabul, so I was meeting a lot of the other uh, leaders of other countries. And they would come to us and say, is America going to lead on this? Because we're waiting. Like, we'll join you, but we're not. You're America. You're in charge of the world. Sorry, you're the empire. It doesn't matter if you want to be or not. You are. And so they would ask, you know, are you going to lead on this? Because if you don't lead on this, we're not going to follow. And that's what's going on right now. We're, we're not figuring out the humanitarian disaster that's unfolding. You know, our instructions from this president are get out of Afghanistan. Wipe your hands. Wash your hands. Walk away. That's the instruction. So we're now watching this humanitarian disaster unfold, and we're not leading on it. And so the rest of the world's kind of coming to us going, you got to lead on this. We can't count on Russia or China to lead on humanitarian issues. If you're going to help save lives, you've got to lead on it. And so, yeah, it is a, there is a little bit of our decline in caring about keeping promises and doing what we said we're going to do. And the world watches that. I mean, they, they, they truly do. They, they keep that tally book of, are we keeping our promises? So that has a lot to do with it. We're just, we're sliding down the, the stack in many ways against other nations which makes China and Russia pretty happy. They'd rather see us equalized by these big world events than have to do something. They don't want to have to fight a ground war with us or an air war or a nuclear war. They would rather just see us trip over our shoelaces. Uh, we can do that on our own. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, hi, thanks. So my question is pretty darn specific, and I just don't know the answer. Um, early on in your presentation, you mentioned, uh, you know, Biden just turned off the spigot and, and we all left. Can you kind of explain to me what Trump's plan was? Because I know May was going to be the end date, but I don't yep. know much more than that, and it got delayed. Um, I guess I'm just wanting a little perspective yeah. on that. Absolutely. So I was briefing both, uh, both administrations, uh, mostly in their defense department, but also uh, some of their uh, diplomatic talks. Uh, I was in on those large, they would bring different scholars and folks together, and so I was listening to both and you know, give my two cents on what's happening. Uh, the Trump plan had a, a peace process in, outlined. Um, if the Taliban kept their promises, you know, their four big promises, then we would leave in May. The Taliban didn't keep any of their promises. So diplomatically, we didn't have to leave in May. Uh, but, but at the same time, Trump really didn't want to push them to, to keep their promises because he would rather leave. Uh, so when Biden, it was a, really a gift to the Biden administration that that was the Trump plan, because he could walk in, and he even kept Trump's ambassador to work on this. Um, Khalil Zad was kept in place. It's kind of the, the guy you could blame. It's, it's not my fault. I, I just let the Trump plan roll out. And so that was really the gift, because we were, we were speaking to the incoming administration about what are your options in Afghanistan. And we talked for like four or five months, had these different meetings and talked about it. Um, and the big cue we got from all the Biden people on their way in was, that's nice. Uh, yeah, that's, that's nice. That's good. That's nice. And then at, you know, at the end of their breath, it was kind of, we're not doing any of this. We're leaving. Because I said I was going to, and Trump already laid out a roadmap. Uh, we're going. I'm taking everything. Not just are we leaving, and we're going to leave some counterterrorism folks behind to keep hunting al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, the, the uh, IS branch that's there. Nothing, like we're taking everything. So that was, uh, that was really the, the way it played out in the end. Um, Biden was able to say, hey, you didn't keep any of your promises. It's gonna take us a little longer to get out of there, but we'll be gone by September or October. And then we were able to get out of there by the end of August. Well, able to, we, we just left. Uh, things undone, but we left. So that was really just, it was a gift. If you've ever seen a president give a gift, the incoming president, that was one of them. 
He took no political hits for it. He could just go, I'm just doing what the last guy started. So don't blame me. Um, which has worked pretty well. The press hasn't pushed him on it. Uh, so yeah, he'll, 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 get a, he'll score points on that one. Yes, sir. So, yeah, that article was pretty interesting. Not a big surprise to anybody who's been to Afghanistan. It's not very hard to infiltrate in that part of the world anything. Um, and remember, we went in Afghanistan in 2001. Most people didn't know when they were born. So how hard is it to forge paperwork? You know, most people were coming. I was born in a refugee camp. I don't even have Afghan papers. Mine are Iranian or Pakistani or, you know, to, from Tajikistan. So very easy to do. Uh, not at all surprised. Uh, the, as I said, the, the Pakistani operation in Afghanistan was an excellent hybrid operation. They ran a 20-year campaign that was excellent. They, they did everything they wanted to do. and We never wanted to, to push them on it. Uh, I was asked in 2020 to go speak at CENTCOM. Actually, it was, I think it was 2021. That was right before we signed the peace deal. And they invited the Pakistani generals to come uh, to this briefing. And I explained to them what they did for 20 years. I ran through the hybrid war that they ran. That's what the topic was on. And they said, yeah, that's what we did to you. What are you going to do about it? I was like, nothing. But it's good to know you, you beat the crap out of us because you're better at hybrid warfare. So putting spies inside the Afghan government, that's all perfect. Russia and China are doing that right now in our own country. You know, how, how many folks are popping up at our universities right now that are just there to steal secrets for China? Like, it is not hard to infiltrate another country and set people up to make things easier when you want to put the heat on somebody. So this, that's, that's pretty, pretty basic. Pakistan's pretty good at that. I get cyber attacked by Pakistan all the time, so I'm familiar with how good they are at this hybrid warfare stuff. They're really good, and China's their buddy, so that makes them better. I'm going to jump back here. Sir. Yeah, I've, I've really got three questions for you, Jason, and I, I appreciate your message today. Uh, first of all, are there any plans at all either formally or more like the Underground Railroad to rescue our friends in Afghanistan, any way to find them a way out. Uh, secondly, uh, you talked about our being open and honest and giving away secrets. Did the social media play any real role in the fall of Afghanistan? And then uh, thirdly, uh, if you look five years into the future, now that the Taliban are in charge, what really is the implication of the danger to us here in America? Mm. Thank you. So first one, um, there are plans by, and I'll tell you there are dozens of citizen groups that have come together um, to, to get Afghans out of Afghanistan. That's the reason most of those people got into the airport to get on the planes, is because citizen groups outside of the US government we're pulling that together uh, while the government was basically running the airfield. Um, our folks were outside the airbase pushing people in and getting people to safe houses and moving them to different places. But after August 31st, that really hit the wall because you can help your government while they're doing an evacuation. But once your government stops their evacuation, if you're still doing that, you're in the human smuggling mode and that's not a good place to be. So that is all really ground to a halt. There are some groups that are having some success legally now. They're, they're getting the State Department to authorize them, to allow them to move this group, to move that group, if you've got enough clout. I mean, one of the Kardashians is involved in this and helped to get uh, some, some Afghans out. So there are groups that are still able to do it. It's really, really hard now. It's really slow. And our big problem is the State Department doesn't have a huge task force of people assigned to fix this and finish it and to speed up the process to get these people out. They just have a very tiny, and the State Department's not big to start with, but this is not their priority. Uh, this is a priority for 800,000 Afghan war veterans, and the promises we made, and a lot of diplomats and development workers and nonprofit people who have left behind people they love. Um, and so it's our priority, but it's not the government's. So that is, that's the problem. You've got a lot of people that want to do it. You've got big donors that'll pay millions of dollars to make it happen, but the government, US government is not helping to speed that along. 
Uh, so it's going to be a drip, drip, drip thing. It's now a marathon. It's not a sprint anymore. It was a sprint until the evacuation ended um, to get out as many as we could. But that's kind of ended now. So uh, that's, that's, that's kind of where things are. I think there'll be a steady flow, but it's not going not to be any time soon. Uh, what was your second question about? Social media. Yeah, social media had a big role in this. As I mentioned, information operations, you know, propaganda, as we like to say, that was a big piece of this war. Uh, we were never really very good at it. Um, Facebook allowed the terrorist groups to use it, and Twitter. I mean, every, all of those bad guys had social media accounts and could say whatever they want in any language they want. Uh, it took forever for Facebook to even have an option for when you found a terrorist on it to be able to report him as a terrorist. Like, that took a decade of us going, can I report terrorists here? Like, this guy's a terrorist. He's showing videos of suicide bombers. And Facebook's like, oh, I don't know. He might, might be a valid account. It's a terrorist. He's like, okay. Um, so that social media was huge. Our enemies used it, and we didn't want to. We didn't know how to. We were just always 10 steps behind them. And they... It coincided with Facebook really taking off in Asia. And so they used Facebook like crazy, and they, they just used it to crush us. Um, so future threats. We now have, we're in this, I, I said that we are now at September 10th, 2001. So think about the threat from Afghanistan on September 10th, 2001. We didn't even know what it was. No one saw September 11th coming. So that's where we're going with Afghanistan. With a terrorist group running a country the size of Texas, that's where we're at. We are going to probably get hit with something we don't see coming. And that's the problem. When you have that ungoverned space, a whole country that large, and you don't know what's happening in it, you're at a, you're at a loss. And we were. This is how it was right before September 11th. We didn't know. We didn't know what we didn't know, and they did the most creative thing that any terrorist group had ever thought of, and we didn't see it coming. So I don't want to think about what's coming next. But that's, it's nothing you can put your finger on. It's going to be something we don't expect. That's scarier to me. I, I like when I know what my enemy's going to do, but we're not in that situation now. Yes, sir? Pakistan is very good at lobbying. Short answer. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. They use that as a threat. They say, if you don't help us, we'll lose control of these nuclear weapons. Who knows what's going to happen next? Like that, they, we get that one every time we ask them to do better. It's not that we haven't. The United States has asked Pakistan to do better and to stop supporting terrorists. But they know that they're going to win the argument in the end. We have nuclear weapons, and we'll lose control of them, and then the world's really in danger. So you've got to help us. We'll lose control of the government if you don't let the army secretly run it. You know, then what if a terrorist takes over the government? Now our country will be... I mean, it's, it's all these worst-case scenarios that they always throw out. Well, if you don't help us, you know, all hell's going to break loose in our country, and then you'll really be in trouble. So it's, it's kind of a threat. Here's my threat, now give me money. And we just keep going through this cycle... Uh, because we're not smart enough to tell Pakistan, fix your stuff, then we'll come back and talk. We, we, we are taking the threat to be real. And uh, I don't know, if you've ever dealt with a child that works that way with threats, you know after a while you just want to spank that child, right? You're like, quit saying, you're, I'm going to just have to... But you can't. You can't go out and take, spank Pakistan even if you want to. So that's where we're kind of stuck in the cycle of you know, supposed threats and issues and things that are going to go wrong. And I had talked to Afghan leaders about that. I said, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but what can Afghanistan say is going to happen if our country fails instead of Pakistan's? Nothing. Because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if there'll be another Osama bin Laden moving in there and you know, launching another September 11th. So it's kind of the enemy you don't know versus what you do know. If they do lose control of those nukes, that's a bad thing. So it's, it's tough. I have had a lot of conversations with Pakistani officers over the years. It is a very frustrating conversation to have because they say the same thing. They have five talking points, and they stick to them. If you've ever been in a negotiation, that's a pretty good way to wear down your enemy. If you say, no, this Cadillac costs $50,000. I'm not moving off of it. 
if you really want that Cadillac, you're going to pay 50 grand. He doesn't have to sell it to you for less. He can walk away. So we're stuck in that cycle with him, and it's frustrating. Uh, and everybody that deals with Pakistan gets frustrated like that. It's, it's just painful to watch. And it's a, I have a lot of Pakistani friends in America, like really dear friends, and they're frustrated. I'm like, I can't believe my country is doing that. Like Afghan, Pakistanis are not like this, but our government is. And it's frustrating to them too. So I, and I, I think that would be a great relationship to really have a you know, come to Jesus moment come to Allah, whatever you want to come to and have a discussion and sort it out so we can fix that because it, it, it messes up all of South Asia and that's the part, bad part. It, it weakens security across the region and that's painful. Yes, ma'am. for student, students. Yeah, that, that is one. It's, it's really behind the biggest problem in, in Pakistan. They have these religious-focused schools along the border, um, mostly along the border. They have them in other places, but you know, tens of thousands of them, pretty unsupervised by the government. A lot of them do very horrible things to the kids that are there. Some of them are just like every other school, but it's it's this problem where they, you know, if you've got 10 kids and one school is offering free tuition, if they'll come over here and learn about religion a lot more. We'll teach them other things, but it's religious focused. So you get this steady stream of poor kids from refugee camps uh, from, from different parts of the country that, that go through that radicalization process. And I know people have gone through it. Some are dead and some came out and said, this is stupid, I'm not doing that. You know, I've, I've watched it go both ways. So. Um, it's, it's a pretty horrible life. I'm helping an Afghan publish a book right now about that journey through a t Pakistan madrasa. He was born in Afghanistan, became a refugee, um, was living on the streets in Pakistan, got pulled into a madrasa. What happened to him in that time frame and then how he made a transition to not be a terrorist and to not go down that road. Um, he was in a madrasa on September 11th in Pakistan being told, hey, we're getting ready to send you to kill those Americans that are coming over here in Pakistan. That's what he was being told as a young man you know, at uh, 17 years old, and he changed his life. Could have went horribly wrong if he'd have followed that path they were putting him on. And it, and it was a horrible life. I mean, it, there's sexual abuse. You know, it's beatings. It's not when you get beat. It's how much you get beat. You know, it is a horrible way to go through it. I mean, these are really corrupted. Uh, they call them schools, but they're not. I mean, it's an indoctrination center. Uh, and they just create robots who want to kill anybody who doesn't think like them. Uh, so there are lots of those schools in Pakistan. That's not, we're not turning off the spigot. That bathtub's still overflowing. Yes? Saudi Arabia built a lot of those, especially in the 1980s. Yeah, they're still funding a lot of them. There are a lot of Middle Eastern countries that fund those, and then the Pakistani army kind of has a deal with them. Ed? Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's, the system has changed in such a way that our, our generals are very, and our, our ambassadors too, they're very insulated. The ambassador is the representative of the president in a country. They have all the power as the most senior American in that country over everybody. And they are the direct representative of the president. Do they talk to the president? No. 
They go through six layers of bureaucracy at the State Department before it gets to the secretary, who might bring it up to the president. I mean, it's just, it's just so convoluted now, and I get it. We're in a lot of countries, and there's a lot of people, and the president can't take his whole day worrying about foreign policy. But if you've got 100,000 soldiers on the ground, maybe that's one you carve out some time for if you're a president. And I think that's probably the most frustrating thing. I, I feel for all those commanders who couldn't call back. You know, there's a great documentary um, came out on CNN where they interviewed a bunch of the previous Afghanistan commanders. And, and uh, one of the guys that I, I knew from the beginning there was like, talk to the president. I didn't talk to the president. I was just in charge of his war. You know? I mean, and it was, it was frustrating for him, too. Like, I didn't even have a chance. Like, he didn't care what I had to say. I wasn't even going to get to see him. So it's got to change, but I, I don't know what's going to change it. Yeah, that's a, that's a frustrating piece of it. Let me see if I can get back to a uh, map here to show you exactly what you're talking about. I didn't even bring this up. This is another issue, but you know, like I said, there's many issues about this war. So Afghanistan didn't used to be this big. Afghanistan used to be bigger. When it was a kingdom, when it was an empire, it had land here, or it had deals with people who had land here. It had land up here or it had deals with the people the tribes who live there one of the biggest tribes in Afghanistan is the Pashtun heritage right there are more Pashtuns that live in Pakistan than live in Afghanistan Pashtuns don't recognize that border now Pakistan wants you to recognize that border right Pakistan is not very wide if you started taking off land Baluchistan does not want to be part of Pakistan it's hardly anybody that lives there. It's not a very populated area. It's the least populated area in that country. But they don't want to be in Pakistan. When Bangladesh broke off, the Baluchis started to try to break off too. And then all that yellow area, the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, that's Pashtunwa. That's a hard K for Pashtuns. Those are Pashtuns. They think they're Afghans. So if, you, if Pakistan loses Baluchistan and the other space above it, how big is Pakistan? There is a paranoia in Pakistan that they're going to lose these lands because this is a young country, like you said. It started when India divided itself up. And India and Afghanistan used to have a border. It was never really agreed upon. They just didn't go, they didn't go into each other's yards. They didn't put up a fence very clearly that they both agreed upon. The Afghans have never accepted that border as a country. Uh, the world has accepted it, but Afghans are a bit stubborn. So, that's your big problem as well. Pakistan always afraid they're geographically going to lose a big chunk of their own country, which is already way too small for 180 million people. That's a problem. We'd be uh, paranoid as well. You know, if Canada started saying, well, we're just going to take you know, Montana and the Dakotas, because we used to have some, some people there. We'd like them too. It's, there's, there's a lot of history involved, and geography always plays a role. Any other thoughts or questions? Sir. Sure. I don't know if NATO will as a group. I think some countries inside NATO, I know we're, a lot of us are going to go back diplomatically. That's going to happen just to stave off the humanitarian disaster that's about to happen. So it doesn't fall into that you know, 1990s era uh, in which the Clinton administration was watching this terrorist threat grow in Afghanistan from the outside and we couldn't get in. So I think a lot will open their embassies. They'll open some economic channels to help Afghans to have an economy and to feed themselves. Um, I don't know if we'll go back in any other way for, for a long time. It will take a very big event. If it wasn't for September 11th, we wouldn't have gone back to Afghanistan. 
we left there in really the late 1990s, early 1990s, late 1980s. We kind of started washing our hands of it and leaving that part of the world. So if it wasn't for September 11th, we would not have gone back. I, I think it would take that level of an event to go back there. Um, I, don't, I don't know how valuable it is to try to get behind an Afghan resistance group and help them overthrow the Taliban government again before it sets itself up. Um, I think Afghans are very tired of war. It's been 45 years, really, of war, like brutal war. Like, I don't know if my kids are going to come home from school every day, war. That's, that wears on you. That's generations that have dealt with that. So I don't know if they want, are willing to fight you know, terrorists being funded by Pakistan at this point or just get the best they can get out of whatever government comes out of this and let diplomatic pressure uh, do what it can. So I don't know if it's smart to go back in in any way. But if we get another September 11th level event to us or one of our NATO partners, we'll have to go back. We're going to have to go clean it up again. Maybe we listen next time and we're, we figure out where to, where to put the broom. The resistance to nation building came from Washington, D.C. That was a political party discussion. You know, people like to throw that around after Clinton and the Balkans, right? That was too much nation building. That became a mantra. So when Republicans came into office, that's where that resistance really came from. We don't want to do anything that looks like nation building because we've been railing against it for the last decade against that other political party. So that was really where that resistance came from. I found Afghans, and I, I traveled all over the country and talked to Afghans. I had heard that myth a lot. Afghans don't have any national pride and sense in Afghanistan. I found that to be untrue. Afghans have a long history. They used to be a kingdom. They encompass parts of Pakistan, parts of Iran, parts of those countries above it. You know, they have held a kingdom together, um, and, and they did it in creative ways, and some of them democratic and some of them uh, autocratic. You know, but they have that sense of it. And if you... If you watch the Afghans, when they saw their national army, and the word national was in the title of their army, the Afghan National Army, the sense of pride, I saw their soldiers when they joined the army, just like when our soldiers graduate from basic training, like that sense of pride was there. And I watched it grow for 20 years. I stayed in touch with these folks from, you know, from young officer through to general. They had that pride. And the people had a pride in their sports teams, in their national army, in their national symphony. You know, they had that pride, and that flag means something to Afghans. So uh, a lot of that is myth building. Um, a lot of that is, is, is partially propaganda from the Haqqani Taliban, you know, side of things. Oh, you know, our country always has to be ruled by a, a heavy hand. It's the only way to it work. So we'd be better than this crazy experiment in a republic with democracy. Um, so I saw it, a lot of other people saw it, but there were always those issues of disunity. And I, I really don't think it's much different than America. I, I mean, I've lived in every region of this country. I, I grew up in New England and then the Deep South. I lived out on the West Coast. I lived in Texas, which is its own damn country. And I liked it. Um, but, you know, and in the Midwest, up in Missouri, like I, in, in, in the D.C. area, we've lived all over this country. We are a divided nation. Like the cultures, they don't even speak the same language. You ever talk to a Creole? I don't even know what they're saying. And I, went, I lived in Alabama. I know a lot of Southern accents. Like, I don't know what they're saying in Louisiana. But it's the same issue in Afghanistan. It's the same in every country. You look at the four provinces of Pakistan. They are all very different. They have nationalism based around their army, around their sports teams, around their cricket. 
you know, they have nationalism as well, but every country is divided as the next, and we're actually going the wrong way, I think, in our own country on that, uh, because politicians have figured out you get elected by doing the other thing, disunity instead of unity. So they're, they're in that same boat in Afghanistan, um, but they, have, they came together for many different reasons, because one, they wanted to end war. They came together as a country for 20 years and had elections and elected people, even though they weren't the best, they, got, they did it and they accepted it and, and kept moving forward for all the same reasons every other country does. So I don't find it to be some foreign country that you can't understand. Uh, and they do understand all the same concepts of democracy and human rights that we do. Um, people just don't want to attribute that someone in Afghanistan could do that. So, yes. A couple questions for you. Do you have any expectations that the U.S. will be evacuating the commandos, special forces, and pilots that the U.S. vetted and trained as part of the efforts to create stability in Afghanistan and the world? What can private veteran groups and rogue Americans realistically do to help with the crisis in Afghanistan? How can we better organize the current intelligence that we still have left in country that is valuable? Are there things that we can start doing now to better set up our commandos to possibly use them strategically to evacuate the rest of the refugees? That's a good one. And I've been chatting with a lot of commandos who I got to know over the years. So we have one of the groups that we left behind in Afghanistan um, who did a lot of the fighting as the, the Taliban Haqqani invasion kind of began. And they, they bought, not fought their way to Kabul. They basically bought out people around the country. That had, those, those spies they were kind of inserting in different places. Uh, some local leaders got paid $10,000 to, to be a traitor and to, to give over, the civilians are in charge of their military, like here. So they, this, they went to the civilians. That's easier than fighting. Uh, but the commandos, are, they're special operations folks um, from, from their different parts of their army and air force. They fought, um, and they fought like tigers. And they, you know, it was kind of touch and go there for a while if they could turn the tide because they were killing so many Taliban and Haqqani terrorists at one time that, you know, Pakistan was getting worried. Like, wait a minute, they, they don't even have U.S. support, and they're still slaughtering these Taliban Haqqani guys we're throwing at them. We're kind of running out of cannon fodder. So that was kind of worrying. To, but what happened in the end is they were ordered not to fight anymore by their own government because it was, they knew they couldn't hold the whole country. And instead of having a total bloodbath in a civil war, uh, they basically just surrendered the rest of the country over. So those commandos mostly couldn't get out. Some of the pilots were able to fly out and get their aircraft to neighboring countries that are friendly um, so they could be rescued. And I'm working with the guy who's rescuing the pilots uh, and flight engineers and getting some of them over here and resettling them. But we, we do not have a good plan for getting the rest of those folks out who fought really well beside us. Some of them have got out, most of them have not. And there is, there is a reluctance on the military's part, the US military's part, to their partners, I mean, we've known some of these guys for 19 years, that's a long time to fight beside somebody. I think of any friend you've had for 19 years, you'd probably do a lot to save their life and their family's life, but we're, we're restricted. You know, are you, I'm, I'm retired, I can do a little bit more, but I, you can't break the law. You can't go against the State Department, you can't go against the regulations. So unless our you know, intelligence community, CIA or somebody else, starts working to you know, help those commandos either fight the Taliban and kill the terrorists over there or get them out so they can regroup somewhere else and come back in. Uh, they're being hunted down, and that's, that's the dangerous part. Them and their families, they're being hunted down and, and killed by the Taliban. There, a Human Rights Watch report just came out today. I don't know if you've read that one, but a lot of those questions were asked uh, as well in it. Um, they're just talking about that retribution that the Taliban are doing right now. And the Haqqani Network that's owns half the government with the Taliban, is a terrorist group. You know, they're on our watch list. They are just hunting down Afghans that worked with us, especially the military, especially the special operations guys. They're trying to basically hold the pilots at gunpoint to fly for them because they want an Air Force too. Uh, the Taliban's never had an Air Force, so they would love one. But the uh, commandos are really um, scared, and, and they should be. These guys, they said when they took over, the Taliban said, We're, we'll provide amnesty for anybody who uh, worked with the Afghan government. And some of the quotes that came out in this Human Rights Watch report, direct quotes from the Taliban, are like, there's no mercy for people like you. You, work, you fought against us. And then to kill them. Summary executions, kill their family too. 
And it's a warning to other people. So it is a hot human rights mess, and I don't think we have a very strong plan, and I, and I don't think we will. I, not, I, I just don't think so. Under this administration and the Congress right now, there is no energy to do the moral thing. They're just going to let them die. And so this is really a tough thing for 800,000 service members who fought in Afghanistan and knew some of these folks for 19 years. This is a lot to watch your government do. The word betrayal is not something you like to throw around. So this has been a tough year for Afghan uh, war veterans. Of mine just got out from Afghanistan. And uh, as long as we have the pressure on the Taliban, they will allow most of those people to get out of there. And I, another nephew of mine is over there right now. He has a visa for, for America. He, he, is, uh, he has been working with a, a nonprofit organization in, with American, and they do not allow him. Yeah. They're not good. It's, it is very hard to get out of Afghanistan right now. And we've had people sitting on airplanes and trying to get clearances from a country to let them land somewhere because you can't take off the plane unless you're going to land. And then it doesn't fall through, and, and then they finally get cleared to land somewhere, and the Taliban block the runway and say, pay us more ransom before you let them out. I mean, it's a hot mess. Uh, this evacuation is, you know, we've got 100,000 more people to go, and it's not going well. So we will see. Any other questions? Uh, I'll come back to you. There is a myth that Americans were running around in Kabul telling the Afghans how to form their country. Again, I was nine of, I was one of nine people trying to build an army. It didn't matter what we were saying and who. We did not have enough people over there to have any sway. So we weren't telling them how they were going to. They decided in their own meetings, in their own ways, what kind of government they wanted to have. We helped them write their constitution with the UN. I say we, it's a lot of NATO countries and the United Nations. We were there basically as assistants and advisors. The choices were theirs. There was a political party that wanted the king to come back, the royalist group out of, really out of Italy. That's where they had sought refuge. They wanted the king to come back. There were others who didn't do very well under the king. And I got to meet the king before he died, the, the last king. They brought him back and made him a figurehead as the father of the nation, but he just sat in the palace. He really didn't have a purpose other than a sounding board for the president. Um, so there were, that was an Afghan decision. I don't think it had done any better under a kingdom than it would. Again, if you don't stop Pakistan from creating terrorists that are coming to kill people, to disrupt the country, and overthrow the government, none of it matters. And that's, that's the troubling part. You could have, I don't know what kind of hybrid government you could have set up. It could have looked like California, I don't know. Um, it wasn't going to matter. If you didn't stop the terrorists from killing everybody and making them live in fear, it didn't matter if you were Sacramento or the Ozarks. You couldn't have stability with whatever you were trying to do. I think that's the real crime in all of this. Any other questions? Did you have another one, ma'am?
we are, I think the global community, and I've been pushing since the beginning to organize all these disparate groups. And I was, when I started helping doing evacuations, I literally had probably 15 different groups reaching out to me. I had you know, the US military reaching out to me and State Department and a lot of citizen groups like asking me questions because I had everybody on WhatsApp in, in the Capitol. And I was, you know, I can get a hold of that person. And we're trying to move people and find people and get them to safety. But unless there's an organized group that's taking that on outside of the US government because they're not interested, uh, it's going to keep stumbling along. I th it needs to be more international. We've, tried to, we've kind of started the Global Friends of Afghanistan. I've got folks from, from California to Brussels involved with that. So I think it's about building one core group um, and getting all those citizen efforts together so they can explain to the Congress what's going on and get funding for it, uh, and explain to NATO, other NATO nations, and get funding for it to keep it going and keep the awareness of what's happening. Because uh, yeah, I agree, yeah, all those stories, especially the folks that have become U.S. soldiers after growing up in Afghanistan and going through these multi-year processes to become a soldier, and then they can't even get their family out of the country. I mean, now they're U.S. citizens in our uniform, and they can't get their Afghan family out. Um, and that is happening across the country. You know, that's not, yeah. It is frustrating. I, I think it's just going to take a, a larger global, a big one humanitarian umbrella that can speak for all those different groups that are involved so they have clout. Because as long as they, they are separated, you, you run into the Afghanistan problem. As long as you're ununified, then somebody can take advantage of, not today, it's not important, your little, it's got to be one big group of humanitarians that are under one umbrella. Um, hashtag Afghan evac is one that's pulling them into a big umbrella. So you know, if you're not part of that, you'd want to join that. But we've got to have something to speak to Congress as well. So I've been talking to a lot of Congress members and trying to inform them about what's going on because they don't know. They're still members of Congress right now and have no idea what I just explained to you. When I tell them, they're like, what? That's been going on? Yeah, it's, it's going to be a while. So last question, Ed. Sure. Yes. Yeah, it's on the one of the early slides, but I don't talk about them much. They they are supposed to do a lot of things. They are not organized to do many things. You know, the UN Human Rights Council is full of human rights abusers. So what, what good is that? That's why the US pulled out of it under the Trump administration. There were all these nations that are human rights abusers sitting on the council getting to make rules about it. And the US is like, this is stupid. So uh, the UN is supposed to do a lot of this stuff. And they, some of their, you know, their, their food programs and some of those things are, are going to keep going. And you know, UNICEF and things for children, they, they will still have impact. And they're in there and they're doing stuff. But, to make any big changes. They, they have the desire, but no capability. And that's what we discovered when I got there in 2002. We met with the UN leader every week. We sat down with him and compared notes. My boss and him talked, because they were working together to build the army and to demobilize. And you know, every week, the UN guy's like, we really don't have much money for this. They're not giving any, any more manpower. And I don't have the ability to make anybody do what we need to do. So help me, America. Maybe your DOD can lean on people. And we did have the money in the Department of Defense to kind of push and pressure people. You know, that's what the US really had to do a lot of, is twist arms. Uh, but it wasn't enough. And the UN's right back in that same spot. So I appreciate you coming out and great questions. And I hope you learned something. And thank you.